So uh, a little bit of a, a pivot from what uh, Leslie and Erica were talking about, really about that hands-on interactive activities and trainings, um, and more of a discussion of how to market your program to make sure that you get the right folks in the room um, and you have a good attendance for it. So um, as Leslie mentioned, I'm with the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension, and I'm a marketing communication specialist. Uh, I'm gonna talk through a couple you know, tips for marketing your program. Um, often we are considered to have a lot of hats if we're uh, hosting the programming, running the programming, then also marketing it. Um, so one thing I would say is, you know, reach out with your organization and see if there is some central communications that might be able to help um, within extension or within NRCS, et cetera. This is going to change, you know, based state by state, but it's something to look into to see if they might be able to either help out or um, have some templates information for you in terms of helping you and knowing that if you're only going to do one or two things because that's the only time you have the capacity to do it to make sure you're getting the most bang for your buck for those so with any marketing um presentation uh, or communications presentation that you hear you're going to hear this a lot know your audience and you guys already do know your audience um what i would the biggest thing i would suggest is when you're doing your program planning um, and you're planning out the agenda you're planning out the speakers you're planning out how you're going to engage your learners also plan out your marketing for it and do that in a way that is written and uh, purposeful it just is treating it the same way you would any other aspect instead of maybe an afterthought which sometimes occurs just because we're all busy and this is not where we're spending our audience our time so with your audience, really think about who is your audience, right? Is it those extension professionals and conservation district staff or NRCS and agency staff, um, what I might consider frontline professionals that are working with producers and farmers? Is it private individuals, right? Private manure haulers and technical service providers that may have a little bit of a different, um, uh, you know, um, perspective than maybe the more public um, sector uh, frontline professionals? Or is it producers and ranchers themselves? And often what I'll see with it, with uh, knowing your audience is that it's so common to hear people say everybody, right? Uh, everyone really working in manure. Um, try to segment that down as much as you can. And really, even if it is everybody, who's your big audience? Who's the number one person you want to target or group you want to target, right? Think of it that way in terms of like your big A, um, even if it is knowing that there's someone else that you'd want to target too, because maybe if you only do two, one or two behaviors, you want to target that, that key primary audience first. Um, knowing that it's fine if anyone else comes, right? So kind of getting away from that general public idea. The other thing is to think about your audience and get to know them. You already probably know a lot about your audience, but again, writing it down and making it purposely can really help with that and help you realize where you might have gaps in your knowledge that you can fill in. So for example, what are the biggest problems that they have that your programming is addressing? Even articulating that pen to paper can be really helpful and then shaping your future communications and how you would promote your program program, right? We're all in the problem solving business. And what is the biggest problem that you're addressing? Um, it could be knowing that there are barriers to attending. Again, you might know all these already in terms of, you know, right now and the certain times of the season, it's not going to be beneficial for them to attend programming because they're out in the field. Maybe it has to be something at night. Maybe it has to be something in person because online internet access is not always super reliable. So knowing what those barriers are, it's also maybe knowing, like Leslie kind of talked about, um, with her audience is knowing where their current knowledge level is. That can also be something to key in terms of getting to know them. And then what are their favorite communication channels? So each individual have what communicators will call a media diet that we're getting. So it could be that we're getting some news from television. We're getting some news from Facebook or other social media sites. Uh, we're getting news from uh, friends and neighbors and groups that we're a part of, as well as maybe from newspapers, et cetera. And we might rely on some of those more than others. So what are the main communication channels that people are getting information from in your audience group? Is it the local newspaper? Is it the ag newspaper? Radio, is it just the coffee shop? Or is it you know, their own um, farm bureau or, um, um, associate, or farm association, et cetera? So really thinking about those favorite communication channels. And once you kind of think about that, it'll help you prioritize which communication channels to reach out to and then what messaging to have, right? In terms of, hey, this is gonna solve your biggest problem. So that's my first uh, you know, piece of advice here is just to be intentional about it and plan it as you would any other piece of your programming. 
When it comes to engaging the media, which is a great option if you don't have a direct list of invitees, right? Leslie's program talked about it being required. Um, so sometimes when that happens, you have a direct list of everyone that you need to be reaching out to. If that's not the case, the media can be a great way to um, engage folks. Um, the one thing to do is identify which media outlets are gonna be the biggest bang for your buck. Like I mentioned, is it television, radio, newspaper? Is it the ag newspaper, the county newspaper statewide? Um, so really thinking about that and what the heaviest traffic newspapers or media outlets are for your audience. Another thing to think about is that um, the media um, enterprise has really changed over the past uh, decades or so, maybe 10, 15 years in that um, so many of these local newspapers or local media organizations have been now bought out by larger ones, and then they have less what we would call beat reporters. So less um, county-based reporters who are, uh, you know, region-based reporters that are reporting on ag or reporting on water, etc. So because of that, they have just less ability to write stories because they have less staff with them. Um, so because of that, the way that press releases have really been generated have really changed. So I would say traditionally a press release was kind of just the facts, ma'am. It was, you know, we're having this event, we're having it here, this is who's hosting it, this is what it costs, this is who's presenting, here's how you can register or get more information. Whereas now the stories that we're seeing that are being most successful are actually more feature stories, which feature story is just that. It's a story, it has a narrative arc to it. And there's some key components to a feature story. So my advice would be to uh, you know try to create your press release in the arc of a feature story uh, when you are promoting it to the media and this does not have to be longer than a regular press release so actually once you kind of get the hang of it it can be just the amount same amount of time there's no length requirement for this so that's an important piece if you're feeling a bit like oh where do i start with this so some key pieces of a feature story they're all going to have a lead this is some sort of hook to them, right? And uh, you can rely on the tried and true hooks. Uh, one would be like an interesting or obscure fact that would fit into it, or a pr uh, provocative statement. Another could be an anecdote, which is just a short story. So, you know, Jim Smith goes to, you know, wakes up each morning and he goes to the same coffee shop to talk to fellow farmers about the ag, you know, the ag landscape in the community, right? So that's your kind of your start to your story. Um, you could also do a quote, so a quote from Jim Smith about how he always goes to the same coffee shop each morning and talks to his fellow farmers. Um, you could have it as a question of where do you get your news? For Jim Smith, it's the local coffee shop. Or a description, which would be more like, um, you know, Jim's walking through his field, feeling the soggy wet under his feet as we recently got rains, right? So you're kind of, again, trying to paint that picture for you. The next would be a transition. So if I'm doing the anecdote piece about Jim Smith going to his local coffee shop, you say, you know, every, every day he's going to his coffee shop, conversation normally focuses on, you know, community happenings, who's, you know, getting married or having babies, um, or, you know, um, the new management practices on the farm. But lately, everyone's been talking about exports. You know, so again, you're transitioning it to what the, your piece of the story is. The next two pieces would be, the more meat of the story where you do want to focus on your programming, on your, you know, event. Um, you want to weave that information and the background information into the story alongside quotes. So, um, you know, a lot of farmers are in similar situation to Jim. That's why, you know, University of Nebraska Extension is hosting a workshop on the future of exports and commodity prices. And then you have a quote from Jim about how commodity prices is really now top of mind because they don't know if he can, you know, what this means for next year, et cetera. Um, and then the last piece of it was be an ending and ideally um, try to relate the ending back to the beginning, right? Um, so, you know, next time Jim goes to the, corn, the coffee shop in the morning, he knows conversation is going to be ex, uh, going to be on exports, but hopefully after attending this workshop, he'll have some more information to share with his, with the group. I don't know, but that's just one example for you. But those are the kind of key points to it. And it really doesn't have to be long. Um, but what you're doing there is you're writing the story for them because then they're going to be much more likely to literally copy and paste that story into their newspaper um, and use it from there <clears throat> or into their news aggregator, et cetera. So some things to also keep in mind, uh, once you have the release, obviously share it with the outlets, share it with the outlets you think it's going to have the biggest bang for your buck in terms of um, that your audience is going to read. 
Um, if you have a relationship with the reporters or with an editor, an associate, associate editor, that's great, especially if they're in your community and you know them. Um, if you don't, that's okay. I think it's still, you can have a kind of an online business relationship where you're saying, hey, you know, I do programming around manure and manure and livestock and poultry management. So I want to make sure that you, um, you know, have information on upcoming programming and there's specific things, stories you're looking for, let me know. You know, just um, being open about it. I think another tip is always put the press release in the body of the email so that they don't have to click a PDF. Sometimes they won't do that. And then offer opportunities to enhance the story. So let's say you're pitching to a radio station and you pitch that story about Jim Smith. If you say, hey, we have Jim too. He's willing to jump on, jump on the radio and do an interview with you if you're interested. You've handed them a beat spot right there. So it may not be that very day or when, what have you, but then they'll know, oh, I'm looking for a beat spot. I had one right here and it's personal interest because it has a story in there and a narrative in there. Same would go with television, right? If you're pitching to a television station of, hey, you wanna do a quick interview with Jim, let us know, he's more than willing to help. Um, same with also you, it doesn't have to be the interview with the, with the farmer, but that's always a nice piece of it because the people will definitely be interested in that from a media perspective, but it could also be with extension and agency and other folks working in this. Another option is to post this story on your own site. So extension site, agency site, et cetera, and then post it on social media tagging uh, the the uh, reporters you think would be most likely to carry the story. I would post the lead of the story as that's going to be the main hook. Um, that can be something as a lot of um, me, a lot of media are active on um, social media, especially Twitter, but also Facebook. Facebook it's harder to tag. Excuse me, it can be sometimes harder to tag an individual, but you can tag the news news agency. Again, just uh, making sure that you're getting out there, and and sometimes also when you're doing that and posting it yourself you'll get some traction from others and then that can build it up to this, the media. So um, just some other options to think about outside of the media. Uh, media is great if you don't have an email list. Um, if you have an email list or addresses or phone numbers or direct contact, that's always gonna be great because you have a direct line to them as opposed to media where you don't. Um, so it's relying on, on those, um, whether it's um, you know publicly available information, right? If it's required. I know like in Wisconsin, we've done conservation professional training where uh, you can get all certified nutrient management planners. That list is publicly available. Um, one note when you are getting publicly available, if you are emailing them, you have to do it through an email system so that they can opt out of getting your emails in the future. Um, but you could also ask um, central or department lists. Um, for example, I know sometimes there's central lists that, you know, extension will have um, that, hey, this person's interested in agriculture. So you can look and see if those lists would be pertinent. Um, and the other thing would just be that tip of in the beginning, I said, get to know your audience. So if it's possible to segment them when you're doing an email or when you're doing targeted outreach um, by either what problem you're solving or um, what knowledge level they have or um, you know what their biggest barrier is, et cetera, that's going to be really beneficial in terms of the more targeted you can get to it, the more likely it is to have an impact. Um, social media can also be a great way to promote um, events. Again, if you have a press release, I think you can use that as your content for social media, um, as well as leveraging those partner organizations and their networks. So just some other options when it comes to marketing your program um, and how to make sure that you're getting the word out and, and getting the word out to the right folks. Um, but the biggest thing with that is just really making sure to make it intentional from the beginning. Uh, with your program planning. 